Hello, this is Mokhtar Mosfi, and this is the second interview with Dr. Michael Roos. Have you also seen that annoying ad that comes up all the time on YouTube? Gaia, Gaia, Gaia. Well, I had to learn how to disable that ad, not to see it anymore. But it has a long story behind it, and an interesting one. Uh, which is not limited to that annoying website. In this conversation, we are going to talk about the Gaia hypothesis and how it was born, when it was born, and a conversation about science and pseudoscience in tales. <coughs> okay, so do you want me to talk about the Gaia hypothesis? Yes. Okay, well, I, as you know, I wrote a book on the Gaia hypothesis. In fact, I don't know whether you've seen it, but I've got it here on my shelf, right here. Hold on. So, this was the book I wrote on the Gaia hypothesis. Um, right. And uh, I wrote it about eight years ago. Um, I hadn't intended to write it, but I... I reviewed some books on the Gaia hypothesis, and then the editor at um, University of Chicago Press, whom I knew, uh, said, I think there's a book here. So I set out to write a book on the Gaia hypothesis. Now, the Gaia hypothesis, as I'm sure you know, uh, was put forward, uh, oh, ooh, 50 years ago now, uh, by a researcher in England who wanted to argue that in fact the um, the Earth is not just a a sort of a what should we say a a a, 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 mach a something dead but you know just matter. He wanted to argue that the Earth is a living organism. Now, this was put forward by a man, an Englishman called James Lovelock, or as he's always called L Jim Lovelock. And he was supported not long after by a woman in America, Lynn Margulis. Uh, I should say that just to start, that both uh, Lovelock and Margulis were and are considered independently very good scientists in their own right. Uh, Jim Lovelock had done a lot of work in the 1950s. He was very good at inventing machines for finding small substances and those sorts of things. So by the time he discovered the, or came up with the Gaia hypothesis, he was already a fellow of the Royal Society in England. So he was at the top. And Lynn Margulis uh, was also at the top. She had been the one who had argued that the more complex cell, the eukaryotic cell, was in fact a hybrid or a blending of two uh, prokaryotic cells, and this made the more complex one. Nobody believed her at first, but then they realized that she was right. And so she was a member of the National Academy of Science. Now, it's, it's, it's not a new idea, but it was certainly not one which was held then. And so what Lovelock and Margulis argued, and I think it's fair to say it was really Lovelock who was the, the guiding spirit all along. And Margulis had other interests as well. She was, I don't mean she wasn't very supportive. She was. But it was not, it was not her central interest, if, you, if I can put it that way. Where is it certainly was, and uh, still is, he's still alive. It's 102 or something uh, of, of Lovelock. And they published a couple of articles in, in proper ju learned journals and didn't get much reaction. So then Lovelock wrote a more popular book on the Gaia hypothesis, which, of course, attracted a lot of attention. And there was a lot of discussion about it, and including philosophical discussion about whether or not the hypothesis that the Earth is an organism can be falsified or not. Does, you know, if you're, if you're a Popperian, can you put it to the test and that sort of thing? And a lot of stuff was written about this in the 1980s. So, as I say, Lovelock came up with his hypothesis around about 1965. He started to publish on it about 1972. And then 
his popular book, I think, was 1979. So that gives you a kind of timeline on what's going on. And uh, hold on, I seem to have lost. There you are. Uh, and so this is the timeline. So in the 1980s, in other words, sort of 10 years after Lovelock first announced it, there was quite a bit of interest by geologists and others as to whether this was true or not. And so there was a lot of discussion about what would it mean to show that it's true and in more, what would it mean to show that it's definitely not true? Uh, because obviously, if you dig into the earth, you don't see a soul or anything like that. So uh, there was a lot of discussion about that, which I think was rather inconclusive. But I set out to write a book and I covered this. And then I realized it was the most boring book I'd ever written in my whole life. I mean, you, I mean, it was 300 pages long. And I swear to God, if anybody could get to page 100 without falling asleep, they were better than I was. You know, you need a strong black copy. So basically, I said, yeah, this isn't going to work. And then I had a, a real brainwave. And I, I, I still think it was a, I still think it was a brainwave. Because the interesting thing was, as I say, Lovelock went really public around 19, I think it was 1979, but thereabouts. And as I say, he got a, a lot of popular attention and the general public loved the idea. Um, people picked up on it and it became almost... It was something certainly that the hippies in California liked because they'd already been arguing just that. And so the idea that the Earth is Mother Earth, organic, that it's living, that we, you know, we are her children. Oh, my goodness me. That went down. And also some quite a few religious people liked it as well. Oh, yes, this is God's creation. and It shows that we're all part of the creation and all of these sorts of things. So, as I say, at the popular level. It became very popular. And, you know, people who were into organic foods, for instance, you know, they, they would have Gaia, Gaia herbs and, and that sort of thing. So, and, uh, oh, somebody wrote a Gaia concert or concerto or uh, something like that. And so, as I say, it was very popular, particularly in California. But these things are, are always popular in California. But... <coughs> but at the same time, I realized that the scientific community, the respectable scientific community, had woken up and they did not like Gaia. They did not like it. And what was interesting was they didn't just think that Gaia was wrong, but that they thought that at some level, Gaia was pseudoscience. It wasn't real science. It was philosophy or religion or something pretending to be science. So it was something, I mean, to give you an example, when Velikovsky used to argue that, you know, the, the planets cause things here on Earth and everything like that, which was very popular. But of course, the physicists all, and the astronomers said, it's not so much that this is wrong. It's just it couldn't be science at the best. It, it's pseudoscience. Or to give you another example, in medicine, you often, oh, somebody's got cancer. No, no, don't treat it that way. Go and eat, you know, have these herbs and that sort of thing. Or vaccination, stay away from vaccination. It's bad for you. Makes you, you know, all you need is to drink, eat, eat certain vegetables and certain herbs. Now, the point is the, the doctors and the medical people aren't just going to say, no, we disagree with this as uh, as medical thing. I mean, look, we've just got these new vaccines which are coming in to help with the coronavirus. Now, it's quite possible that some firm will come up with, well, they've just come up with, a, with, a, uh, with an antidote, with a vaccine. Now, it's perfectly open for others to say, let's test this. And, oh, yes, we agree. It's 95% efficient. Or they may say, no, we disagree. We think there's something wrong with your statistics or about, that you are only, only testing Iranians when you should have been testing real people like English people. That if you test Iranians, I'm not surprised it worked. But take real men 
of both sexes, the mm. English, and it only works 65%. Now, the point is that these people are not going to be disagreeing and saying, you're pseudoscientists. They're going to say, you're scientists, but you're wrong. So, I mean, that, I mean, you can have a debate at that sort of level, and nobody's going to say, no, this is, we're not talking science, we're talking pseudoscience. No, they'd say, no, this is, uh, this is perfectly good science. Another place where you get pseudoscience is chiropractic, you know, the, the business of manipulating the, the spine. Well, a lot of regular doctors would say, not only is this not going to work, but it, it couldn't work. It, it's, it, it absolutely ignores, you know, what we know, modern medical science. I mean, within modern medical science, there's lots of room for disagreement. Nobody's going to deny that. And somebody might say, I think that cancer is caused by this. You know, let's say foodstuffs. And another person might say, no, I think it's caused by air pollution. And a third person might say, no, I think it's all genetic and there's nothing. You right. You could disagree. And you try to find tests to a different thing. But nobody's saying the other side is pseudoscience. They're saying there's science, but I don't accept it. I think it's wrong. Whereas chiropractic, I think a lot of regular doctors would say, I don't care how much people think they're getting from this. It, it has absolutely no bear. You, you, don't count, you don't cure cancer by fiddling with somebody's backbone. That's just not it. I mean, that's just ignoring everything we know. I mean, so this is what a lot of people want to say about President Trump, is not that he's a bad scientist, but that he accepts pseudoscience because he, he has no interest. So the interesting thing was people like Richard Dawkins, who has a loud voice even when he's being quiet, was saying not only is Gaia not right, it's pseudoscience. It never could be right. Now, this is interesting because let's let's suppose you put forward a hypothesis, let's say in, I don't know, medicine or something like that. Well, the first thing they're going to say to you is, excuse me, Mo, but what are your qualifications? As You don't have to be an MBD, but I'd like to see that you've got a PhD in epidemiology or something like that. So in other words, if you might you don't have to be an MD, but you have to know about medical science. Otherwise, you're just not qualified to talk about this. Well, because the interesting thing was that Lovelock and Margulis had better credentials than most of their scientific critics. So, yeah, I mean, I'd, I mean, Lovelock's not a particularly pushy or proud man, but the simple fact is he was better respected as a scientist than Richard Dawkins was. Uh, and so I said gosh, there's something interesting here. Interesting for me, not as a scientist, yes, partly as a historian, but really as a philosopher, because I want to know, first of all, why it was that the scientific community disliked it so much. Secondly, at the same time, I want to know why it is that the general public liked it so much. And why, when they were arguing, they weren't so much arguing like this, but they were arguing like this. You know, I mean, one saying this and the other saying that. Well, I mean, if you've got science, you can argue. You know, I think this vaccine works. I don't. Bong, bang, bang. The vaccine works. Or no, no, it works, but not as well as you thought it did. Fine. But when you've got this going on, the trouble is there's no resolution. So I was interested in, in what was going on. Now, I'm an evolutionist, so what I do when I want to find these uh, answers out is I... Hold on, I've just, you're just a small picture on my, on my thing. It's OK, I, I've, I've got you, it, it's OK. Uh, yes. You've got me, have you? Yes, I have got you. OK, that, that's, that's... OK, that's... Oh, I see what I'm going to do. Hold on. Oh, the, oh, my God, now I've got you. I've got, oh, I've got so much of you now. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I don't know that I want this much. <laughs> Hold on. Is it over, maybe it's over here. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I, I've, I've got you well enough at the moment. Oh, Anyhow, okay. 
Okay, so as I say, oh, I see. Choose screen to share. Well, I'll not share. Oh, it doesn't really matter. Anyhow, so what I'm saying then is that as far as I was concerned, there were some really interesting. Oh, just a sec. I think I can get it this way. Oh, there we are. Now I've got you back. Okay. So, uh, uh, anyhow, so what I was saying was, I was really interested then, but I'm an evolutionist. And so I think that when you want to know things about the present, you look at the past. I mean, just to take an example that will make sense to you in your situation, if I want to know why Iran and the US are on such bad terms, yes, I can look at what's going on today. But my first question is, let's go to the past. What's let's see, there? you know, this? let's see when this started or let's go back. Let's go back, you know, to the First World War and, you know, the founding of all these different states after the First World War and these sorts of things. And let's see if some of the problems we're living with today were problems because things were done in the past which, as it were, now we look at it and we say, well, I could have told you it would go wrong, but you didn't, you didn't listen to me. So I was interested in this. Now, what I found was that this turned out to be a, an absolutely wonderful topic for somebody like me, who's both a historian and a philosopher of science, because I went back to the Greeks and Plato in the Timaeus believed that the earth is an organism. He, think the whole, he thought the whole universe was. And although Aristotle didn't quite think that, he was certainly on side with looking at things from an organic point of view. He, he thought in terms of what are known as final causes. And what I discovered was that it was during the scientific, the big thing about the scientific revolution, Copernicus to Newton, was less the science and more the change of, of what uh, linguists call root metaphors, that up to then, everybody had looked at the world organically. And then after that, people looked at the world from the point of view of machines, mechanically. And so the mechanical position pushed out the organic position. Except, of course, it didn't entirely. And certainly the German romantics, people like Goethe, and the philosopher Schelling and the anatomist Lawrence Ocken all said, no, we want to accept the organic metaphor. We, we, are fav we believe this. And the interesting thing is, from then through, you've had a succession of people, not just Germans, but uh, certainly in, in England and in America, and not just in California, but California it went down well, but who are organicists who look at the world from the point of view of an organism. Now, I found something very interesting that I don't think Lovelock wanted people to know about, and that this is the following, that the rather strange German mystic polymath, Rudolf Steiner, who was the founder of the Waldorf schools, everybody knows about the Waldorf school system, was in fact a, an organicist, and he was a believer that the earth is an organism. Now, Lovelock's best friend in the 1960s was the novelist William Golding, who's famous for writing The Lord of the Rings. Is it The Lord of the Rings? Lord no. of the Fly, Lord, Lord of, of the, the Flies, flies. <laughs> Lord of the Flies. <laughs> That's all. <totally. laughs> flies, rings, what the hell? Anyhow, so, and I discovered that, in fact, although I don't think he still believed it, that uh, William Golding had been a very keen supporter of Rudolf Steiner. And I'm pretty certain that Lovelock got an, a lot of these ideas from there. We know that the, the name Gaia, he, he said, I got it from Golding. And we know, for instance, that Lovelock sent one of his children to a Steiner school. When I asked him about it, he said, oh, no, 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 no. But I expected him to say that because Steiner <laughs> is certainly not very, uh, what shall I say, not considered very uh, uh, high up. I mean, he certainly is considered to be a, a pseudoscience in, in scientific circles. For instance, he argues that vaccination is a bad thing 
because getting childhood illnesses like mumps and measles and these things are part of normal childhood development. And so, as I say, I think Lovelock got it from there. Now, OK, but it was starting to come clearer to me now that, in fact, Lovelock was a regular scientist. But with the Gaia hypothesis, he was moving from the mechanistic position over to the organic tradition, which, as I say, had been the one before the scientific revolution, but had been revived by the German romantics, people like Goethe. And, of course, then had a great influence, for instance, in American thought through the transcendentalists, people like uh, Emerson and Thoreau. And so there had always, right up to the present, been this tradition. I mean, for instance, uh, the philosopher A.N. Whitehood, Whitehead, uh, who was an Englishman but went over to Harvard, and he was the founder of process theology. And he was a very keen organicist. Uh, didn't think that we should regard things mechanically, always said, no, the right way to look at things is organically. So, in other words, what I found was that I wasn't surprised on the one hand that people like, um, like Dawkins were very much opposed to the Gaia hypothesis because for them it represented something out of the tradition that had been rejected that had you know, been rejected back in the 16th and 17th century. And Dawkins, if he's certainly, if anything Dawkins is, he's a mechanist. I mean, Dawkins says that he looks upon genes as, you know, it, the, the body is just a machine for making more genes for the next generation. I mean, Dawkins mm -hmm. is quite explicit in trying to think of, let's say, the working of the genes and transmissions and these things. Not organically. It's all, you know, cogs and wheels and things going round and round and round. So Dawkins is completely in the mechanical tradition. So for somebody like him, the guy hypothesis, which is in the organic position, is going to be anathema. Whereas all the, if I say the Californian hippies, the Calif you know, all the people who believe in organic food and, you know, organic medicine and these sorts of things. All these people who say that the secret to good life is not taking drugs, but eating the right foods. And, you know, you must avoid meat or you must avoid gluten or you must, whatever it is. And so uh, they're all the organic tradition. And so, as I say, I didn't find it at all surprising then that so many people over there took, took, took the guy hypothesis with a great deal of pleasure. And the fact that so distinguished a scientist as Lovelock was pushing it was music to their ears. So this was what I found the clash to be. Now, how does it resolve itself? Well, there are different parts of this because it wasn't long before, as I say, the regular scientists weren't just saying that that Gaia was wrong, but they were saying that it was pseudoscience. Uh, now, one interesting thing I found out, which I didn't expect, is I don't think there is any such thing, as it were, existing out there that is pseudoscience. I mean, I think it's existing out there that you're Iranian and I'm not, okay? I mean, I, I, I think that is an objective part of the world, okay? Mm -hmm. Whether or not, let's say, uh, what should we say? Whether or not the, uh, the kind of position that Vice President uh, Biden represents, as opposed to the kind of position that President Trump represents, two very different perspectives on the earth, very different philosophies. Well, of course, obviously, these aren't just matters of fact. Biden's an Iranian, uh, Trump's an Englishman sort of thing. I mean, that's not, you know, it's much more a question of dispute. And I started to realize, and I don't think I was the only one, that in fact, pseudoscience is not some thing. It tends to be a label that people throw at other people when they want to 
make them seem less attractive. In other words, if you're my if you're my opponent, let's say, and of course this happens with politics. They say, oh yes, the trouble with Trump is that he just believes pseudo science. Now, of course, Trump supporters would say, no, we're the ones who've got real science, and you're the ones who, if anything, are the pseudo scientists. So the t- term goes back and forth like this, and so. I started to think very much that maybe the reason why Trump was being called, I'm sorry, why Lovelock was being called a pseudoscientist, there must be some reason why the people like Dawkins were doing this. And of course, one of the reasons you do it is if you're feeling insecure. If, for instance, you're not quite sure of your position, then what you do is you dash off and call the other people pseudoscientists. Uh, I'll give you an example. My university 20 years ago started a medical school. Now, it's a very young medical school. And so, of course, a lot of people, medical schools are very expensive. They take money from the rest of the campus. A lot of us didn't want that medical school. So what the medical school did was they said, ah, yes, but we're going to turn out general practitioners who will work in rural areas and work with black people a lot. Now, how can a good liberal like me object to the medical school then? I mean, you know, I mean, it's they're not just serving the rich. They're going out to help people that I think should be helped. Yeah, so I said, I'm in favor of a medical school. But then one of the politicians in Florida, who was a chiropractor, got a, a lot of money, I don't know, $20 million or more, and gave it to the medical school and said, I want you to start a department of chiropractic. Now, had Harvard done this, well, you know, Harvard can do this. But a a young medical school in the American South, which is only 20 years old, it, it could not afford to have a faculty or a department of chiropractic within it, because everybody would jump on them all over and say, what the hell kind of place is this? So what was interesting? was although I know that the doctors and chiropractors in Tallahassee, where I live, generally get on just fine. And I know there's more than one doctor who doesn't really believe in chiropractic, but thinks maybe, you know, spinal manipulation isn't a bad thing. We'll say to somebody, well, you're having a lot of back pain. You know, you might try a chiropractic. I'm not sure it's going to work, but you might find it, you know, even if it's just as placebo. So, in fact, relationships were very good. But of course, as soon as the orthodox medical people became threatened, the first thing they said was, oh, chiropractic is a pseudoscience. I mean, I went through the newspapers and found this. They never said it before, but then they said it. And then when the money was taken away and it wasn't, they they gave up. They never, they never, I never saw another claim that chiropractic was pseudoscience. So I thought, why are Dawkins and company calling Gaia a pseudoscience? Well, of course, the thing is, as you probably know, or perhaps you don't know, is by the 1970s, there were a huge number of rows, not to do with Gaia, going on in the, in the evolutionary community. For instance, Edward O. Wilson had published Sociobiology, and his critics, even people in his own department, like Stephen Jay Gould, were fighting, and so they were fighting. So they were not happy campers. They were, you know, and then, as it were, when Gaia came along, it was like something wonderful from outside. They could all join forces and, you know, forget their own differences and say, woo, you know, it's, I, what should I say? It's like the English and the Scots and the Welsh don't much like each other and they're going to be fighting. But then the Germans, you know, arrive on the doorstep and they want to invade Britain. And it's not England. You know, it wasn't the Battle of England. It was the Battle of Britain. Suddenly, the English and the, the Scots and the and the Welsh all discover that they're friends and they're all part of the same community because they're going to fight Hitler. So, and now, now it's over. What's happening is that the Scots want to vote for their own independence. So, you know, it's it, one of these things which goes up and down. So I had a strong suspicion that a lot of the opposition by the scientists 
to Gaia was less hardline science and more a function of their own insecurities. I mean, I don't think it was just that. And I think that this is very interesting because in the last, let's say, 20, 30 years, Gaia has done very well, except nobody calls it Gaia anymore. They call it Earth System Science. Earth System Science. It's, it's the same stuff. They don't use words like organism, but they use the same arguments that, that, that Lovelock does. And now people say, yes, uh, you know, Lovelock was certainly the founder of Earth System Science, and that is a thriving part of geology. So, you know, yeah, they're not going to use the name Gaia because that's got bad connotations. They might not even talk about the Earth as an organism. But why did Lovelock want to say the Earth is an organism? Well, because he said, I see, you know, it's like the blood going round. Things, you know, there's, there's loops of causation. A causes B, cause, you know. The, the sun causes the rain, the rain goes up in clouds, then the clouds descend on the earth, and then that fertilizes the earth, and then it flows back in rivers down to the sea, and then the sun does it all over again. And of course, he not, said not only that, but often as the steam rises from the sun, I'm sorry, from the sea, bacteria get up there, and then the bacteria go on, and then the bacteria, you know, it, in other words, it's a feedback system. And what Lovelock said is, that's just what you get in an organism, so the Earth is an organism. What today's scientists say is, that's terrific. Yes, there's these feedbacks. Organism? I'm not talking about that. <laughs> and so I think, to, to bring a long story, and I obviously I'm talking nonstop, to a close, I, in, a, in the end, I felt very, very pleased with this little book. I mean, I don't think... You know, it's not the critique of pure reason or something like that, but it turned out to be a, a very nice essay uh, in, what should we say, the history of philosophy of science. The Gaia hypothesis, it was put forward by good scientists. It was very popular with the general public. It was hated by the scientists. It had a long history, but then what happened was I asked, why did the scientists hate it? Well, because as much as anything, because they were insecure. It wasn't really Gaia's problem. It was their problem. <clears throat> and of course, now there are a lot of these problems have been worked out. So they, you know, their worries have gone. They're not a thing like as insecure. But what has happened to Gaia is it goes on and does very well, but it changed its name. So it doesn't look like something in the organic paradigm anymore. It looks like something in the machine paradigm. Yeah, because, just... you, I mean, you get feedback loops in, I mean, in, in, in um, the mechanical world. You know, pumps do this, heat, steam, steam is condensed, water trickles down and starts all over again. The, the heat generates the steam, the steam goes up, it, you know, it, it, it's used as a pump. And then what happens is you squirt cold water in, the steam is condensed and causes a vacuum, so the pump gets drawn down, and then the, the, the condensed steam is pulled out by a valve and goes trickling down to the bottom and is heated up again. So it's good. that's perfectly mechanical. It's not organic. And so I think what happened was that Lovelock's organic hypothesis was, as it were, transformed and taken from the organic world over to the mechanical world. They no longer used, of course, because they're not in the organism world, they're no longer going to call it an organism. They're going to call it, a, you know, a feedback system, or so, which is perfectly acceptable in the, in the... And so I think today what I would end by saying is it's a really interesting story. I think Lovelock I think more and more of us, and certainly like people like me, are looking and saying, yes, we can see a lot of the reasons why Lovelock got up people's noses. And as I say, I think it's quite possible that Lovelock got a lot of his ideas from Rudolf Steiner, who really is a bit of a crackpot. But that's OK. People get them from different places. But he was a good scientist and he knew that there was a problem there. He want, I mean, Lovelock started off, he said, the Earth is 
is being heated up by the sun, and yet it doesn't get hotter and hotter and hotter. What's going on here? He said, well, I could tell you what one reason why it might be is because you've got a feedback system. The, you know, humans stay at a steady, a steady temperature, 98.4. You know, even if it's cold outside, even if it's hot outside, they've got ways of self-regulating their temperature. And so Lovelock said, I think the Earth self-regulates its temperature. And then, of course, Lovelock immediately said, which means it's an organism. Now, I think Lovelock really was onto something really important scientifically when he was talking this. <clears throat> it was clouded in the language of organism. And maybe he wouldn't have done the work had he not been thinking in terms of organism. I mean, people do that sort of thing. Uh, but I think looking back today, a lot of us would say, you know, Jim Lovelock really regard deserves a great deal of credit for being a, a visionary scientist. Yes, it was it was strange, and he maybe he was in the wrong you know the wrong way of thinking. But he he hit upon some things <clears throat> which we now know are tremendously important, and he deserves full credit for that. He's the one. So I think today, a lot of geologists, anyhow, would say, yes, uh, we think that uh, Earth system science is very good, and Lovelock is owed a lot. Of course, on the other hand, there's still a lot of people in California who believe in organic things, and all, and they, you know, have Gaia festivals and all of these sorts of things. But you know, that's California for you. How's that? Okay, right. And the, some part of the explanation that made me was kind of uncomfortable was that you mentioned that pseudoscience is a label. It makes me quite uncomfortable because I believe there should be ways to distinguish science from pseudoscience. Pseudoscience. Well, I mean, as I say, this is a term which is used. Uh, people have discussed pseudoscience a lot. And it's one of those slippery terms that people have a, a great deal of difficulty defining what you mean by pseudoscience. Now, I could imagine there may be a discussion. If I want to say somebody's Iranian, I could imagine somebody who knows more about the country might want to say, yes, I would call these people Iranian, but these people are Kurds or something like that. Although they were born in Iran, they belong to a different culture, Uh, maybe a different religion. So I'm not sure I want to call them Iranian. I mean, so I could well imagine there's going to be debates at that sort of level. But nevertheless, I think most people would feel fairly comfortable with saying, well, let's work those out. Let's, you know, let's deal with those. But because obviously you're Iranian, you're not, a, although you live in Poland, you're not a Pole. And you're certainly not an Englishman. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Because I am not superior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I'm telling you that right now. Uh, so the point is, although we can have debates exactly where one thing ends and where another thing starts, there's no question that we know these terms. But then there's some things, I think, which are just slippery, just slippery. And where one thing begins and another thing ends or whatever, I think a lot of people would say, yeah, I'm not sure. And as I say, there are certainly terms like pseudoscience, which I think are much more subjective than people often think they are. People think, oh, yes, either it's a pseudoscience or it's not. Well, I want to say maybe there's, you know, there's a, a place in the middle that some, yes, But there are reasons why, and this often happens, why people would want to label something one way or the other. I mean, you know, I mean, these are things. I mean, some, you know, somebody from Iran might say, I don't look upon myself as a revolutionary. But somebody in the U.S. might find it very convenient to speak of these people as being revolutionary. So, as I say, the one group might say, yes, we're doing this, but we don't we think we're being true to the, let's say, the uh, fundamental uh, uh, precepts of Islam. 
we're not really revolutionary. If anything, we're traditionalist conservative. Whereas others might want to say, no, I think you're being revolutionary. But of course, the thing is, if you're a traditionalist, by and large, you don't threaten people. But if you're a revolutionary, then, you know, then it'd be Bin Laden and all this sort of thing. We start to get worried about revolutionaries. And so, as I say, I think often these are these are emotive terms that people use. And my strong feeling was that pseudoscience was one of them. And, and today, I think you'd probably have to go a long way. Certainly, you're never, ever going to find somebody who says Earth system science is pseudoscience. Nobody thinks. Everybody says, no, Earth system science is a very secure and important and well-functioning area of geology. No question about that. I mean, it, it fits in with plate tectonics. It leads to a lot of important issues. It can be used for technological purposes. Yes, Earth system science is not a pseudoscience. Of course, what they'd say is, but of course, don't forget, we have, we have discarded a lot of the metaphysical baggage from the organicist side that led it to be called a pseudoscience. I think an earth system scientist can say, I absolutely do not believe that the earth is a living being. However, I do believe that feedback loops are absolutely a fundamental part of a system like the earth, that it keeps it in stasis, it keeps it at level sorts of things like that. So somebody like, might say, I absolutely believe that right down the line. But I don't think that that makes the earth into an, an organism. I mean, just, I don't. So as I say, and so this side you might call a pseudoscience, but I think an earth system scientist would be very upset if you call them pseudoscience. Although I have talked to a couple of them and they said, we learned very quickly <clears throat> 20 or 30 years ago when we were getting going really on earth system science, the one thing, the one word we did not put in our papers for publication or for conferences, there was okay. one word that we absolutely did not use. And that was Gaia. They said to me again and again, they said, I, I give these talks. They are, you know, they're almost straight out of Jim Lovelock, but the one word I absolutely do not use is Gaia. Because as soon as I use the word Gaia, they put me on this side and I'm done for. So, you know, it, it goes, you know, just like that all the way. God, I don't know why it is. I, I, I think I keep knocking. You know, when I get talking, I get I tend to be very um, not just vocal, but I you oh, crikey. I use my hands a lot. And so, of course, one part of the problem is every now and then I knock my computer sideways <laughs> and my computer says, up yours. Yeah, we don't like it. You see, they just did it to me right now. They say, we don't like being knocked sideways. We'll show you. We'll cut you off from the full vision. And so that's what they've just done. And now they and then I have to get now I know. You see, so this is what happens is I get very you can see this. I use my hands a lot. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I think if you tied my hands behind my back, <laughs> I, 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 I would be, I'd be. You wouldn't be able to speak. You know, so there you go. Anyhow, so that's my that's my take on pseudoscience. Then what are we doing on time? So have you got a couple of questions throughout me? And then I think huh. we've we've got a, a nice little if you don't mind my saying so, I think we've got a nice little unit there. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, as you described, Earth. Earth system view, I, I can com comfortably accept that. It is as if uh, it is originally, it originates from the Gaia hypothesis, but has gone through Occam's razor and has become something totally scientific without the word Gaia, without all those uh, organic well, differences. Say, yeah, as I say, Gaia itself obviously is organicist. And I don't think you can change that or people would want to change that. And I think if you talk to Lovelock himself, I think although Lovelock very pleased to have Earth system science, I think Lovelock himself still has yearnings in the direction of organicism. 
when I think that when he was talking to um, uh, who was it, you know, the, the author of William Golding, and uh, when he was sending his kids to a, a Steiner school, I think that Lovelock was much more caught up in the metaphysics of organicism and seeing things that way. Now, that didn't stop him being, you know, so what he was doing was bringing his mechanical understanding over there. And I think that's what happens. And then, of course, there was the blow up. And so particularly Lovelock's students and followers took the mechanical stuff and brought it back again. But of course, you know, it was Lovelock who, you know, drew attention to this. But as I say, I think Lovelock himself is a little bit sorry. Uh, yes, he knows that people aren't going to use the word Gaia in their talks, but he wishes they would. <laughs> and so that's what happens. Thank you very much. My, my wife's bringing me a cup of tea and she's looking at me and saying, you've done an hour's talking. Time to you finish. There you go. <laughs> OK, so I will uh, soon uh, let you go and I will pause the recording, stop the recording right now.